I'm I'm paranoid because I, we blew that one recording. I'm just making double double secret probation. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that um that we're not losing a, a whole recording session. Okay. So this is one in the can. Yeah. To put in the can for, uh, I think, for next weekend. Thanksgiving weekend. For Thanksgiving weekend, because we're probably going to be super busy. Um, this is an unapologetically me-centered rant. Okay. And um, <clears throat> it sort of combines, it's sort of an essay, as in I wrote it out this afternoon. Yeah. Um, and it sort of combines some things I've been thinking about for a while and some current mm-hmm. events. But I wouldn't exactly call it polished, so it's going to be a rant. I'm not going to worry too much about it being too long Randy. or too ranty. Okay. So we'll hear it, and maybe this will uh, get some things out of my system, such that I can be like, "No, I've already said my last word on those things." Said my piece. Yeah, I don't know if I can ever truly do that. Yeah. So. All right. <clears throat> This, I think I'm going to call it the Democrat Diaries. Okay. Um, So some historic context on political parties. And I want you to feel free to chime in and tell me what you know or anything you... Yeah, I don't know much. Go on. (laughs) You you know something about this stuff. You did take a lot more history than I did, although that was, you know, a while ago. Yeah. So I tend to get called out whenever I talk about the idea that either the Democratic Party is failing or collapsing, or talk about voting third party. I get lectured about, on you know, on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever, about how America is, did I just say how America? How America. How, how America is a two-party country, and basically... <laughs> the Constitution, it's a two-party country. We only can ever be a two-party country for structural reasons. And... There's the there's the the seed of an interesting argument in there, yeah. Because um, without runoff voting, yeah, or ranked choice voting, yeah, or a coalition system, yeah, and with what we call first past the post mm-hmm. system, and winner take all, yeah, um, it's really hard, if not impossible, for third, fourth, and fifth parties to actually continually thrive to thrive and do something of value they just get absorbed like the libertarians got absorbed by the republicans they get absorbed or they're constantly just pushed to the margins yeah, yeah. Uh, so the american system does generally stabilize on two parties that's right. true mm-hmm. right and it's done that historically continually continually however yeah <clears throat> the however is the big the, the big however part. right uh, this doesn't mean that those two parties don't change and change very significantly. Right. Sometimes they change to different parties with different names. Yep. In modern times, uh, what generally happens is the name remains the same, but the song changes. Oh, right. The content of the party changes. Right. But the name of the party stays the same. So the idea that the two parties that we have today are the parties we will have indefinitely. These are our forever parties. Yeah. Um, and so, therefore, uh, in order to get your ideas and policies supported, the only option is to support the current party that you disagree with less. Hmm. That idea is really quite ahistorical. It's completely ahistorical, honestly. Uh, but and carry on. In fact, we didn't uh, require our answer. Did you hear buzzing? Yeah, is that your a fly? No, it's it's like a noise in the headphone amp. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm not sure why. It's just like a noise in the AC or in the power adapter. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. I heard it too. I heard it on our last uh, podcast too. Oh. These, but just showed up briefly. I don't know what's causing it. Okay. It's ha- harmless, presumably. Carry on. Anyway, that's a historical, mm-hmm. and in fact, we didn't require previous generations mm-hmm. of people. We didn't scold and lecture them quite so hard about supporting only the the two and only existing parties so there and a lot of the great political transformations in america involve third parties involve third parties and involve transforming parties right so i'm going to talk about that a little bit Mm -hmm. um 
I want to mention some of the background history of political parties in America. First of all, you were kind of joking about this, but it's true. The Constitution does not mention political parties. No, it doesn't. Nowhere. <laughs> Nowhere in there. It's not, it's not written in stone. Uh, Washington was not a member of any party. So there. And he was also... Founder. He's very important. <laughs> well, his writings are important. He was cautious about the influence of parties, and some of the other founders have been somewhat skeptical of parties at parties. the same time that they were, were engaged in them. They were engaged in them and, and active with them, but they were Hamilton of, right. with um, was a pig Federalist yeah. and Madison with what became the Democratic Republican Party. Yes. Democratic Dash Republican. Which is what we have now. Which is what we have now, but we'll get to that. Okay. So uh, in Washington's farewell address, I want to quote him here. Uh, One of the expedients of party is to acquire influence within particular districts, is to misrepresent the opinions and aims of other districts. He means pop, just populations, populations groups. groups right? uh, you cannot shield yourself too much against the jealousies and heart burnings which spring from these misrepresentations. They tend to render alien to each other those who ought to be bound together by fraternal affection. Yes. So that's a pretty deep statement, actually, and probably requires some unpacking for modern language. He was basically talking about solidarity. Yes. So there are people with whom you should have solidarity by every conceivable, like you're yeah. from the same region, you belong to the same religious group, you belong, belong to the same racial or ethnic group. Um, you have a lot of shared background. Maybe you have the same class struggle. Maybe you share the or, same class struggle. Or maybe you both are metalsmiths and you really should band together to form a metalsmithing union or, or whatever you know. right but and if you're opposite on opposite sides of the political party divide you'll find yourself alienated fighting, fighting against each other yeah even though you're natural allies right so that seemed like an important statement to me i mean for example there's a certain way in which everybody every single person in the huron river watershed right has shared interests, has, so very has fundamental shared interests. Shared interests. Yeah, uh, about you know land use and that and watershed covers and Milford, Brighton, Ann Arbor, and Ypsilanti into Wayne County. Yeah, no, it's huge. And the political divides between those people are bigger. Are bigger than the fundamental reality that unites them. Sure. And that's that's kind of what he's getting at. Yeah, is the way in which uh, people who have who are natural allies and should be natural allies and should be working together politically, will work feverishly against each other because they belong to opposing parties. Yep. So he wrote about this quote: "The spirit of party, not like partying." Woohoo! But Ooh. um, that was my essay. He <laughs> said, "It serves always." to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot and insurrection. F foments riot and insurrection? Yeah. <laughs> he actually, I left a little bit out, he actually goes on to say uh, how it, it leaves um, leaves us vulnerable to uh, meddling by foreign countries, and I like. Oh my God, he's talking about Russia Gate. I was like, but I dropped that part because I didn't want to try and unpack that. But it was but pretty funny. Yes, yes. Uh, it jumped out at me. Mm -hmm. Anyways, it's it's always it's always both a little difficult but a little fascinating to read the actual writings of the founders. You know? Yes. Um, it's worth doing for every American, <coughs> honestly. Every American should read the founders. Yeah, and you know, get help interpreting them or studying yeah. the context, because uh, their their concerns are our concerns. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. Yeah. So historically, we've gone through at least five and maybe six so-called party eras. Historians classify these into mm -hmm. the first party system, the second party system, et cetera. Right. The first was the Federalist Party and Democratic Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Then when the Democratic Republican Party came apart, we had the Whig Party and the Democratic the Party. Mm -hmm. Then we had an anti-slavery version of the Republican Party. Uh, they went away. 
then the Progressive Party, which was dominated by the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Then we're into the New Deal era, where the Republican Party had a conservative and a moderate wing. Mm -hmm. So um, there's some debate about whether we would say that we're now today in a fifth or sixth party system. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, could, I could be convinced either way. Yeah, when the current system started. So the first five systems lasted 30 to 40 years each. Right. So if the fifth party system ended in the 1960s, we ought to be in the sixth or seventh, honestly. We're at the end of that system. That's what I'm going to argue. You're jumping ahead of oh, me. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, it's too- It's good. So historically, when a dominant party loses two consecutive House elections and a presidential election, that's considered to be the indication that the the things have shifted. Shifted. It started. The laser power. The locus of power has has moved. Um, Right. These electoral flips have been coming really quickly now, like Mm -hmm. every every four or eight years, Mm -hmm. and. so I don't think what we have now clearly fits this classic two-party model. I think we're basically looking at one party defined by its financing with two front offices. Right. Yeah. I, and I think, well, I, I will say, and I hope I'm not jumping too far ahead, I think that's not an accident. Oh, no, no. Okay. That, that, that wasn't like, oops, look at that. Oh, what happened here? No, especially, uh, and maybe we can talk about this a little bit, uh, especially now that it appears the Democratic Party has given up on the left to court the right. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's how shall I say, it's given up on um, winning. <laughs> uh, for the sake of financing. Yeah. <laughs> that too, yeah. It's really kind of absurd, but carry on. Uh, so the systems have degenerated too much for what we have now to really be considered a system. It's more like a churn, you know. Yeah. And it's like, uh, ultimately, it is like a managed and wanted kind of churn. Oh, very much. Yeah. Yeah. So historically, I think we'll mark the end of the fifth or sixth party system with Citizens United. Honestly, that's, uh, I believe that will be considered the end of that. I think that's reasonable. Of that system. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm far from an expert on this, uh, but this is just me saying Dominant parties can and do collapse and get remade historically. Oh, yes. And so it should not be considered a stretch or even uh, any kind of a radical position to say, we've reached the end of the Democratic Party as it's been constituated in the Clinton era. Yeah. No, that's not absurd at all. It's, <clears throat> it's more absurd to think that this isn't coming or isn't about to happen or that isn't it's, in, the pro- in process. That it's going to continue long past its sell-by. Right. Date. That, that just hasn't happened in the past? When it's been ineffective, it keeps losing houses, house seats and elections. Right. You got to, you know, it's time to rethink what's going on or just look at what's going on. So, and back to the idea of third parties. So, we've never had a stable period of three powerful parties at the presidential election level. No. But, like, for example, before World War One, I. I was, it was awesome before World War One in lots of ways. Okay. There were 600 socialist mayors. Yeah. Right. It wasn't yeah. so, <laughs> it wasn't so crazy to be a, a socialist or even an out and out communist. communist. That you might organize with a party and win local elections and do local work. Yeah. And honestly, uh, I'm not really making this about Sanders per se this time, but uh, he's really, to my view, he's just sort of channeling an older political model. Oh yeah, uh, which uh, is which was a national norm until yeah, the First World War. Yeah, especially I, I don't know if he's he would consider Debs to be probably a, a hero of his. Oh, fair. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Anyway, uh, he might have disagreements, but he can speak for himself. Um, they have a lot of influence from third parties in down ticket and local races. Mm-hmm. You have these realignments where a third party becomes one of the two major parties by kind of supplanting it. Supplanting it, it right. And the original sort of collapses and withers away. Like the state. <laughs> For example, oh, I realized as I wrote that I was channeling uh, Karl Marx. Uh, 1856, Republicans supplanted the Whigs. 1912, Progressive Party surpassed the Republicans, and this allowed Wilson to win. Mm-hmm. So then they kind of acted as a spoiler. Right? The, the progressives 
acted as a spoiler for the Republicans. The Republicans. Oh, yeah, right. the Progressive Party acted as a spoiler, right. Right? right? And that happened, and that happened historically. We're still here. It's okay. You can right. have spoilers. That can happen. Yeah. Right. Hello, Wilson was a real shit. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, in that same election, Eugene Debs won 6% of the vote as a socialist Huzzah! party candidate. <laughs> so... Um, my whole point is that when a party ceases to be popular and ceases to democratically represent voters, it's vulnerable to this kind of realigning election mm -hmm. uh, and also to being supplanted by a third party. Uh, mm -hmm. For some people, including some political scientists, that is just terrifying and unacceptable, and they have to do everything they can to pretend that's not happening. It can happen. It can happen. But it doesn't make any <clears throat> sense. I mean, they, isn't this what they study? I, it almost seems like they don't study history, oh. but I don't see how, I so mean. what the hell are they doing? I don't know, but yeah, this was one of the other people I unfriended on Facebook, Oh, by the way, was a political science professor friend of mine who I knew in college. Oh, that happens. And I just, I couldn't believe how... How informed he was about politics? Well, how narrow his thinking was. And what a basically what a what a scold he was, you know. Bad Paul, no biscuit. I, I just I it just went on and on after I kept asking him to just drop it, you know. Just move and, on, man. And so I finally unfriended him. But I like you're a department head, Jesus, Jesus Christ! Christ. <laughs> Are you bickering with me on Facebook, Facebook. about my vote? <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't. Lie. Don't you have some papers to grade <laughs> or something? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, you know, keep your eyes on your own paper. Keep your eyes on your own paper. <laughs> um, so, but if you saying. if you step back historically, you might see it as a sign of health and life in the system. Oh, yeah. It's vitality in the system, which yeah. has historically been very dynamic. Dynamic mm -hmm. systems can adapt and live and evolve, and uh, become more suited to changing conditions. And mm -hmm. static ones fail and die. Mm -hmm. So, with all that context, yes. This is uh, the this is the introduction. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I wanted told you it was going to be long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have a seat. Yeah, sorry about that, Adam. Just just relax, <laughs> get some tea. We're coming in for the second round now. I want to talk about Donna Brazil's revelations, what they actually mean, and how people are responding to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. What I think they mean. What you, well, yeah, what you and why I think they're important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I, I don't want to give the impression that I think she should be lauded as some kind of hero. Okay? Oh, God, no. She is a party hack. Chop, She's chop. a partisan. Chop, chop. You could call her an apparatchik. Oh. Is uh, that an insult? Well, if you spell it with a C-H-I-C-K, it is. Oh. <laughs> no. no I, wouldn't, I would never do that. That would be sexist. <coughs> but Russia... <laughs> Stop, stop. Let's remember that she actually was interim chair of the DNC in 2011 and 2016. She was Al Gore's campaign manager in 2000. She worked on campaigns going back to Jesse Jackson and Walter Mondale in 1984. And she was a superdelegate. Hmm. And she's trying to sell a new book. Oh, all the above. Right. Yeah. So She, she ran Al Gore's campaign? Because that, yeah. that campaign sucked. Well... Yeah, so she bad. wasn't so no, she wasn't so great at it. Oh God! I, no wonder she like distanced her name from that. Great. <laughs> <laughs> now I'd like to say I just could pull all this facts and dates out of my head, but no, I had to get onto Wikipedia, of course. Well, and, yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. Anyway, but I I didn't have the I didn't really know she'd been around for a while. Yeah. You know. So, um, this is what I like about her. Okay, she has been a voice for playing by the rules. In 2008, we had a strange situation in the Michigan primary. Do you remember the? Um, drug memory. We went to vote for in the primary, and Barack Obama was not on the ballot. Oh, that's right. Yes, yeah, I remember it was that. so strange. I, I kind of blocked it out until I was rereading about it today. Yeah. But I remember going to vote in January, right? Which was very unusual. It was very early primary. Yeah, and uh, I couldn't even. Vote for Obama. So I'm like, why the fuck am I here? <laughs> so, What's that about? Um, Michigan and Florida both changed their voting dates to be earlier than the party rules allowed. 
And so the party had said they couldn't vote before, I think it was February 5th or something right. like that. They changed them to January. Huh. They wanted to have more influence on the on the primary. The Who wanted to have more the influence? The Michigan Democratic Party. Wanted more influence in the primary. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so... Um, so they moved the primary so, earlier. So they moved their party primary earlier, and they broke the rules set up by the DNC. Right. And uh, Brazil believed that they needed to be punished for this. Right. The part, the the state parties. Okay. And so she was opposed to seating any delegates at the convention and sticking to the rules. Mm-hmm. Clinton still advocated seating all the delegates. Mm-hmm. Now the Republicans did the same thing, right? So, Florida and Michigan, because if the Democrats are going to move, they're going to have to move too. We can't, you know. So, all right, you got to have the primary. So, uh, the RNC wound up seating half their delegates. They're like, okay, you guys are going to get sanctioned. The sanction is we'll only seat half your delegates. So, there. The DNC did wind up seating all their delegates, but gave each one half a vote. Like, oh, same thing. <laughs> it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Okay. Right. We can't do what the Republicans um, are doing. But, that would be weird. <laughs> so, but I do give Donna Brazil, she she took a, a stand saying, no, there has to be a consequence for breaking the rules. your rules and agreements. So she gets in my head some credit for standing up against two states that were trying to game the system in some way. Like, how is this gaming? But I, I, that's, I don't understand. Well, how is this gaming the system? I can't. How does it hurt? Why does it matter? I can't go too far into that because I really don't quite understand it. Okay. But I just remember that as a result, several of the candidates pulled their names from the ballot. Oh. And I think at least one other didn't get on the ballot because the paperwork didn't didn't happen in like, time. Like didn't happen in time. Right. So it was a conf- it was a strange a really convoluted mess. Right. And I'm not really sure what they thought they were achieving so maybe someone can clarify that or i'll have to look it up later but that's sort of a side point but but this is i'm just pointing out a time when donna brazil like stood up for something and made a difference and except she was overruled but there it is but no she she stood up for following the rules which yeah you know i got respect for following the rules (coughs) as long as they're not criminal rules um and I believe in this kind of behavior because I think without the threat of whistleblowers and exposure, institutions like the DNC invariably become corrupt. Right. Uh, they become the slush funds well, for their tend, operators. Well, they tend corruption anyway. Sure yeah. they do. But mm-hmm. they wind up working at cross purposes to their own charters. Their own mission. They become Potemkin villages pretending to operate smoothly as democratic institutions, small d. Hmm supposedly promoting the interests of their constituents while they're really being puppeted by other influences. So, which brings us to Brazil's revelations about the DNC. So, what did she actually reveal? Hmm. Well, the first first thing is that some of these things were actually known. Yes. And had received some coverage in the press, but usually in like the obscure the obscure press yeah the kind of stuff that you and i read like common dreams and stuff like that not oh yeah like true stig and all yeah, stuff. yeah not in uh wasn't politico the, not in politico it wasn't the new york times was no the CNN. no yeah no but so a lot of the stuff wasn't a shocking secret the numbers were to me were surprising but and some of the details um mm-hmm. so let's acknowledge it's standard practice for the primary winner to take over control of the dnc Mm-hmm. Um, Obama was in charge of the DNC. Actually, part of the DNC's troubles were that he kind of let it languish while he was in office as far as fundraising went. Oh. And so the DNC mm-hmm. was in debt after the election and remained in debt. And uh, After uh, the 2008 election? Yeah, yeah. straight mm-hmm. through pretty much. Yeah. And and it still was in debt leading up to the primary for, for 2016. Mm-hmm. And that's there that's a lot to unpack too because they were paying all these consultants it was kind of a corrupt yeah. you know it was just like a revolving door like like a wingnut welfare program for democrats <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, i'm in the wrong business yeah well you really got to be a consultant mm. you got to be a, a, a beltway insider but consultant then I gotta say things that are like just lies lies oh come on <laughs> Okay. You want a paycheck or you want to be a good person? Your call. 
Uh, Clinton's campaign signed an agreement. This was their big revelation, the text of the agreement, uh, to fund the organization and control messaging and the debate schedule before the primary, almost a year before the primary. Oh. That's the big revelation. So the, and effectively, here's the unwritten text. Yeah. If she does that, then they then have to give her the primary. The entire primary process was basically mooted. Was mooted because it, because she was underwriting it. Or made moot. It was made moot because she was the underwriter of the process. So the candidate that we're trying to decide if people want, the Democrats want, yeah. is underwriting the primary process. Yes. And therefore expects to get the candidacy. Yes. And it wasn't just underwriting. It wasn't just financial. She literally had an agreement that her staff would uh, approve any DNC communications or documents released about either about any primary candidate. Oh. And uh, approve hiring. Oh. And approve all messaging. Huh. So she basically was the DNC. Was the DNC. Huh. And I suppose if she'd lost the primary then that would be shocking. <laughs> I mean, under those conditions, it would have been shocking for her to lose the primary. Yeah. Right. So, Jerry Riddle and Medium, the DNC worked on behalf of the Clinton campaign and against the Sanders campaign, all the while professing neutrality in that race, a neutrality mm -hmm. that is written into the DNC bylaws themselves. Mm -hmm. Everyone assumed the DNC's appalling behavior, from the debate schedule fiasco to the constant efforts to smear Sanders and his supporters, the business about the data breach, the business about... The accusation about chair throwing riot by Bernie Kratz and and <laughs> yeah, yeah, because Bernie supporters are so vicious. They're violent anarchists, Paul. Yeah, in Nevada, no, that's uh, me. the yeah. insistence that Sanders didn't condemn violence, you know, his uh, all the rest uh, was a consequence of the DNC, as people thought that all of this was a consequence of the DNC as an independent entity improperly favoring Clinton over Sanders. Right. And that was like, that. we all thought, wow, they're really biased. Look There's this obvious bias going on. But he writes, it was even worse. It was all Clinton all along. She all had time. control of all messaging. Yes. <laughs> she was doing that. She was doing it, saying her it. Her yeah. hires, her mm -hmm. everything. Right. She signed off on every bit of that. Mm -hmm. So when Brazil's book excerpt came out in Politico, the pushback on Twitter started immediately. Right. Um, people were saying this is all just business as usual. This is normal. Clinton is doing the party a favor. She's funding them. She should yeah. be grateful. He should be grateful for her love and support. Um, Sanders had a similar agreement. He should be grateful. They were saying that uh, that this only applied to, agreement only applied to the general, which was not true at all. Uh, uh, no. None of this was true. Basically, everything they threw up as chaff to deflect this was not true. It was just chaff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Sanders could not have had a similar agreement. How would that even make How sense? How would that make sense? How could he sign on to, all, I'm also going to be in charge of all messaging, <laughs> messaging and approve hires, right? How, how's How that going to work? <laughs> right. Yeah. And his fundraising, so he did sign a fundraising agreement, yep. but he didn't wind up using it nope. because his funding came, I believe, either entirely or almost entirely from small individual donations. Oh, like some overwhelming margin. It was like not not like 50%, not 60, but like 90%. It was, it was some yeah. large margin of his funding was from it was, yes. small donations. So he didn't even make use of the kind of funding agreement that Clinton had. And that funding agreement is also very interesting. And mm. You've probably heard some of the details about it, but I'll get to that too, just talk about just what that meant. Yeah. So... It's kind of sleazy, actually, but kind of. The pushback also included Russian propaganda. That people claim that Russian propaganda was behind Sanders. Of course. And actually, that so, so that much. Sanders, not Clinton, had an unfair advantage. And Hillary was just doing what little she could to defend herself. Right. So this... Uh, There's so much sexism. This con job was really just her coming up out of desperation with a way to you know to try to stand up to 
<laughs> Straight face. Uh, um, just doing what she can. Yeah. Just poor little Clinton trying to get by. <laughs> uh, this doesn't even that that argument doesn't even make any sense because the Russian propaganda that we do know about came out for the general and not the primary. The primary. So how do you know that, Paul? <laughs> Have you seen the documents? <coughs> The Russians were engineering this I've election seen, from the beginning. You know what? I've seen this, the the dumb ads that they ran. It al- it almost is like those dumb YouTube videos, yeah. like generated by bots. bots. <laughs> Vote for Trump, yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. Comrade, <laughs> Comrade. <laughs> join Bernie Sanders. He give you free vodka. Free vodka. Mm. Uh. Um, so to quote Riddle again, you try to craft some fake impression of a double standard to use as a weapon against Sanders, and it never, for so much as a moment, occurs to you, as you're doing so, that this behavior, the corrupt behavior you're trying to rationalize, proves Sanders was right about the establishment all along. Yeah. It's far worse than he'd suggested. Uh, if, 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 of course, like most Democrats, you dislike Republican efforts to game the system to their advantage, mm-hmm. you're now the one employing the double standard. Yeah. You're already very down on Russian manipulation that's merely alleged, but you give Clinton's manipulation a pass. A pass. There's a great article in Counterpunch by Margot Kidder. Are you... <laughs> Go ahead. Say it. Say it. Say it. Are you kidding me? (laughs) She is. Yes, that Margot Kidder. Um, From back in April 2016, uh, this was on Common Dreams, entitled How Hillary Clinton Bought the Loyalty of 33 State Democratic Parties. Uh, And this was uh, Counterpunch or Common Dreams? Counterpunch. I don't know. I have to look it up. It's on I'm my computer. It was, I'm thinking it was Common Dreams. Okay. I've maybe it, seen maybe it was that, that, that's Common what, Dreams. That's what shocked me. Right, Margot right, Kidder right, was okay. writing for, for no, Counterpunch. No, no, no. You're right. They're too... Uh, They're very different. Yeah. Okay. I can't keep my... You know, honestly, I don't read these things that much anymore. Right. But I, I, I know I the editorial them. bias of, the, right. of each of them. So. Right. And she doesn't... They're not my favorite sources right. anymore. She doesn't map as a no. Counterpunch writer. Okay. So this is quoting Margot Kidder. Yes, we're through the looking glass, honestly. No, she's been an activist for a long time, apparently. I guess, yeah. Yeah. So, in August 2015, at the Democratic Party convention in Minneapolis, 33 Democratic state parties made deals with the Hillary Clinton campaign and a joint fundraising entity called the Hillary Victory Fund. The deal allowed many of her core billionaire and inner circle individual donors to run the maximum amounts of money allowed through those state parties to the Hillary Victory Fund in New York and the DNC in Washington. Uh, this is long. I did edit. This is just some excerpts, right? It's a long article. But yeah. um, the idea was to increase how much one could personally donate to Hillary by taking advantage of the Supreme Court ruling in 2014, McCutcheon v. FEC. This is an important ruling mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that knocked down the cap on aggregate limits as to how much a donor could give to a federal campaign in a year. Mm-hmm. It thus eliminated the ceiling on amounts spent by a single donor to a presidential candidate. Right. A single donor, by giving $10,000 a year to each signatory state, could legally give an extra $330,000 a year for two years to the Hillary Victory Fund. For each donor, this raised their individual legal cap on presidential campaign to $660,000 if given in both 2015 and 2016. <clears throat> and if you also donated an equal amount in your spouse's name, which was legal, mm-hmm. now you're talking about $1.2 million. One million three hundred and twenty thousand dollars oh, Is that right? That sounds, that sounds uh, right. Okay, she moved on her math wrong. I don't know. Uh, from anyway, so it's, it's a shitload of money. Yeah, it's okay. a shitload of money. yeah, <laughs> and it's legal. So from these large amounts of money being transferred from state coffers to the Hillary Victory Fund in Washington, so they donate this shitload of money to the state. Mm-hmm. They'd go to the Hillary Fund. The Clinton campaign got twenty seven hundred dollars. The first twenty seven hundred. The DNC 
was to get the next 33,400, and mm-hmm. the remainder was to be split among the 33 signatory states. The 33 signatory states, for the most part, immediately sent the money back. Right. So, um, with this scheme, the Hillary Victory Fund raised over $26 million for the Clinton campaign by the end of 2015. From 26 people. She describes how this works in Montana. The upshot is that a whole load of billionaires, hedge fund managers, and lobbyists who have no business in Montana, no relationship to Montana, don't live there, don't vacation there, don't have employees there or anything. Nothing. Nothing. Each gave the Montana State Democratic Party $10,000 in 2015 because <laughs> they were given out to all the signatory states. Right. <clears throat> Kinder explains... The agreement with the Hillary Victory Fund and the DNC could solve some of the Montana State Democratic Party's financial troubles while simultaneously funding several state and federal candidates. But the scheme would only make sense as a benefit to the parties involved if the money raised actually stayed in the states that received the initial checks. Mm -hmm. This did not happen. Did not happen. Oh, the Montana State Democratic Party received $43,500 from the Hillary Victory Fund on November 2nd, 2015. On that same day, it transferred $43,500 back to the DNC in Washington. And on December 1st, it received another $20,600 from the Hillary Victory Fund. And on the same day, the Montana State Democratic Party sent that exact same amount, $20,600, back to the DNC in Washington as well. So... How does this help? It allows people to donate large amounts of money to Hillary's campaign by sending the money through several different accounts. You know, money laundering? It is money laundering. Oh. If it was any kind of a business transaction, this would be considered money laundering. This would be a crime. Yes. It okay. was not a crime. Yeah, it was not a crime. But it, it's it's money laundering... Just not because it's, of its it's just nature. it's literally just a workaround for right. avoiding campaign spending limits by taking advantage of this Loop aggregate up. limit. Right. So. Okay. Right. Carry on. So CNBC. This is a different person now. Um, Jordan Cheriton explained. Uh, basically, in exchange for raising money for a near-bankrupt DNC, the deal provided the Clinton campaign with advanced screening of communications sent out about other primary candidates during the primary and gave it, as Brazil pointed out, and the documents confirmed, control over which of the two candidates previously identified as acceptable to HFA, Hillary for America, would be hired as DNC communications director. Just to make sure we're clear, this happened almost a year before the primary. Before the primary ever started, right. She got to basically appoint DNC staff, had control over messaging. <coughs> right. I mean, it's, it's, it's worse than this. Uh, there's more detail about the exact details of the agreement, but these are the big ones. Mm-hmm. Um, Cheriton continues, Does any objective person think the Clinton campaign... When given the say so on who the DNC communications chair would be hiring would be during the primary, wouldn't try to ram through a communications director who benefited them immediately, thus helping them to become the general election candidate. Hmm. The DNC hired Louis Miranda, a veteran communications operative for establishment figures, including John Kerry and President Obama. WikiLeaks revealed he worked overtime behind the scenes on behalf of DNC chair. Debbie Washerman Schultz, who was Clinton's 2008 primary co-chair, to plant hit pieces on Bernie Sanders in media outlets during the primary, Mm -hmm. which ultimately got him fired when Brazil cleaned house. Oh, yeah. So another, like, chalk one up for Brazil doing a little bit of a right thing. Almost the right thing. Yeah, right. I mean, the right thing would have been to (coughs) call bullshit and all this at the time. Out the whole damn thing. That would have been the right thing, but, you know, whatever. This is uh, Cheriton, Jordan Cheriton continuing. Sorry, it was Louis Miranda, L-U-I-S. Right, not Louis. Uh, does any objective person think the DNC wasn't making decisions like planting debates at dead zones like Saturday night before Christmas, having its chairwoman go on national television to falsely declare chairs were thrown by Sanders supporters at the Nevada State Convention with zero video evidence of such right. violence due to the fact that the DNC had handled over 
handed over sizable control over finances, staffing, and messaging to Clinton in order to, in exchange for Hillary keeping the money flowing into the DNC. Right. If you want to see uh, some great examples of this, um, read Thomas Frank's article in Harper's November sixteen, November twenty sixteen, mm-hmm. entitled "SWAT Team." Mm-hmm. <coughs> it's about how Sanders was covered by the Washington Post. Oh, that was so. And how they literally turned on him on a dime and became like just a ridiculous number of hit pieces, really ridiculous hit pieces. Right. They were planted there. That was planned and organized by the DNC in their context. And meanwhile, their coverage of Clinton was like 50-50. And before this turn, they had been relatively even-handed towards Sanders, too. Yes. Maybe a, a bit more skeptical, but not. they weren't blatant hit pieces piling on left right. and right. It's a pretty fascinating and horrifying article. <clears throat> but democracy dies in darkness. <laughs> <laughs> what? The post would suck it. Cheriton says, I've never before seen the press take sides like they did this year. Oh, no, this is, uh, sorry, this is Thomas Frank now. Mm-hmm. I've never before seen the press take sides like they did this year, openly and even gleefully bad-mouthing candidates who did not meet with their approval. This shocked me when I first noticed it. It felt like the news stories went out of their way to mock Sanders or to twist his words, while the op-ed pages, which of course don't pretend to be balanced, seem to be of one voice in denouncing my candidate. I mean, Frank doesn't make any secret of the fact that he was a Sanders voter. Right. <clears throat> So, I take a take a deep breath. So, <laughs> head's gonna explode. Just, just count. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, to be clear, the DNC charter reads: the chairperson shall exercise impartiality and even-handedness as between the presidential candidates and campaigns. The chairperson shall be responsible for ensuring that the national officers and staff of the Democratic National Committee maintain impartiality and even-handedness during the Democratic Party presidential nominating process. Yes, which would be the reason people gave them individual donations. (laughs) Uh, Clinton's agreement with the DNC actually contained the following text. Nothing in this agreement shall be construed to violate the DNC's obligation of impartiality and neutrality through the nominating process. Of course not. How could it? <laughs> so, <laughs> With a straight face. <laughs> it's just not possible that those realities can overlap. What color is the sky? It's matter there, bro. and antimatter. What color is the sky? Anyway, on your but that planet? was. That was some lawyer saying, oh, shouldn't we put something in there? Well, this isn't yeah. actually designed to look impartial. Just, yeah, yeah. This, this isn't actually designed <clears throat> to circumvent the entire party process. Okay. As if the memo and the charter could coexist in some kind of sensible way, which they right. can't. So. Okay. All right. So, hey, we're almost done, actually. Okay. We're getting up to the present here. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's remember that when Sanders <clears throat> supporters sued the party in Florida on the grounds that it was blatantly partial... The DNC's defense in Florida court Mm -hmm. was to claim that they were under no obligation to provide fair primaries. Oh. So I was just reading. So it can all be be a sham. Keep keep voting. (laughs) Keep voting for us. It's all a sham. I was actually reading the transcript of motion hearing had before the Honorable William J. Zloach, United States District Judge. I read that this afternoon. This was a class action suit against DNC Services Corp., that's the legal branch of DNC okay. and cool. and Debbie Washing Machine Schultz. Hey, now don't make fun of her name. <laughs> Sorry, the ch- one of the Chapo guys insists on calling her Debbie Washing Machine Schultz, and it's really childish. But yeah, 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 yeah. and I'm I'm terribly childish. Uh, it's Debbie Wasserman, too far. Even <clears> it's me. too far. It's, he's gone too, too far. far. Uh, yes, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. The plaintiffs were residents of 45 states in the districts of Columbia who contributed to the Sanders campaign and the DNC, as well as all registered Democrats. Those were the plaintiffs listed in the suit. Mm-hmm. Right? Three different classes. 
Oh, I, am I part of that suit? I don't think so. Okay. The plaintiffs claimed fraud, misrepresentation, unjust enrichment, breach of fiduciary duty, and negligence. Oh. So the yeah. DNC's attorney was this guy, Bruce V. Spiva. Hmm. Yeah, I heard of him. <clears throat> he testified in a Speedo. Spiva in a Speedo. No, no come on. Stop that. Uh, he made various claims before the judge. Among the claims, he actually said, and I'm I'm trying to. This is like a a court transcript, so it's the language is a little. It's a little dry, but it's okay. Uh, well, no, it's hard. It's, he was stuttering, and you know. Oh sure, Wait, we're grown up here. We stutter. I think there's an impossible showing of causation. I mean, the court would have to find that people who fervently supported Bernie Sanders and who purportedly didn't know that this favoritism was going on would have not given to Mr. Sanders, to Senator Sanders, if they had known that there was this purported favoritism. <laughs> now, I, I did, I, I went through this whole document and it hurt my brain, I have to say. But yeah. I did feel like I understood his arguments and they're all very technical. Right. Like, you are technically correct. The best kind I'm of correct. correct. <laughs> <clears throat> so, he's saying basically... it. it an impossible showing of causation. In other words, it wouldn't be possible to show right. that if people knew the process was corrupt, they wouldn't have contributed to Sanders. Right. Uh, except that they're except bringing could, suit because they yeah. <laughs> wouldn't have given to Sanders if they'd known it was very, corrupt. It's, it's very, not solipsistic, but, um, but yeah. uh, uh, s s sophists kind it's of very sophist. game. Uh, sophistry. Yeah. It, it never, I, I, sh <laughs> I will admit though, I have to admit, it never quite made sense to me. The lawsuit idea? The lawsuit idea. No. It's really just like it people was a protest. are so pissed Pissed off, they had to do something. Yeah. It, it was a protest suit. They wanted to get this kind of out in public. Right. Uh, in other words, he, he claimed that it was impossible to prove that Sanders supporters wouldn't have not given if they had known the DMC was completely biased and had their thumbs on the scales. So... Um, he he makes a complex argument that has multiple legal prongs, but there is one particularly startling co uh, quote, which has been in the media before. But mm -hmm. And then in terms of concrete injury, which was really the first prong, that again is problematic because, and this goes back to your honor's question, there is no right to, just by virtue of making a donation, to enforce the party's internal rules. And there's no right to not have your candidate disadvantaged or have another candidate advantage, there's no contractual obligation here. <laughs> hmm. That really hinges on what kind of definition you have of a contract. contract. I mean, nobody's, when you donate money, you don't get a signed affidavit back from your party saying, right. here's what we're going to use your money for. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It's like, and and <clears throat> to some extent, it doesn't exist with any nonprofit, right? Right. You send them a donation. I mean, you've got... But there are very clear expectations about what the donation's for. So he continues to argue that in questions of, quote, how the party runs itself, how it decides who it's going to associate with, how it decides how it's going to choose its standard bearer, that it's the party's right to make that determination. And they are, quote, internal issues that the party gets to decide basically without interference from the court. End quote. And I think that's actually true. Yeah, that's true. Because what's the alternative, right? Yeah. Um, he then compares the DNC to a charity and how if you gave money to a charity, you have a, a charity case. <laughs> basket case. You have an expectation that if they pocketed the money instead of putting it towards the specific purpose you gave it for, you might have a case. <coughs> but when it comes to expecting... The party to represent your preference, you don't have a case because the DNC could have, and then this is a quote, voluntarily decided that, look, we're going to go into back rooms like they used to and smoke cigars and pick the candidate that way. That's not the way it was done, but they could have, and that would have also been their right, end quote. Hmm. <laughs> this was the DNC's argument for why they didn't have to represent voters. Noted. it. Well, basically, though, he kind of set up the argument. I think I think you could, you could prove that in effect they'd pocketed the money, yeah, and didn't do what was expected. That's exactly what happened, right? Yeah. So what? So you know, and they don't have a right to pocket the money and not do anything for not it. Not do anything for it, right? So 
uh, so this now we're coming to the to the last the last bit bit here. Okay, so, section three. <laughs> I don't even have markers. It's just one big wall of text. On this. <laughs> I wall. just start typing. You know. I, I hear you. Um, it's a luxury to die to many. <sighs> Okay, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so this may all be technically correct from a legal standpoint, but to me this is really a, quote, naked lunch, unquote, moment, which is when suddenly the light comes on and you get to see what's actually on everybody's fork. Right. Oh, my God, what are you eating? (laughs) Uh, I've been running on for a while on this subject. What's the upshot? What's the bottom line? What's the bottom line? What does this mean? So this is when I try to... boil this whole thing down to what it actually means to me and mm-hmm. should mean to you. I try to argue that's what it should mean to you. Okay. And again, you're welcome to try and talk me out of it or talk me down. Mm-hmm. Um, after the election, the Democrats were claiming <clears throat> that, hey, Sanders people, just shut up. Clinton won the primary fair and square. Right, come on. Between superdelegates and the contribution scheme and the vetting scheme and messaging control a year before the primary, Mm -hmm. they can no longer make this argument. Can't make that clear. We can say we have a mountain of evidence that suggests that it was not fair and square. Well, and for me, what it comes, what that comes down to, I kind of don't have a horse in this race. Yeah. Right. But, Given that there was no chance you were ever going to vote for a Democrat. No, was well, there happen. was little chance I was going to either. Right, but, so that wasn't going to happen. But those were the arguments I engaged right, those in. Those are the arguments, right? The arguments people had. Um, I think given that that was just an outright falsehood, Yeah. what this amounts to is that, in effect, it is these machinations that gave us Trump. Not third-party voters, but yes. these machinations. That's my belief. That brought 45 into office. Especially when when you look at polling right after the election, you really see that if the polls were accurate, Sanders in a straight-up race would have, well, would have, would, won would have beat Trump. And it's you can't prove that. You know, you can't prove that. <clears throat> and, and, I, and I actually, personally, I kind of remain unconvinced. Sure. There's lots of... There's lots... Of gaffes that could have happened. Oh, so many things. Maybe he happen. collapses on stage. Whatever, I I lots of things that could have happened. Maybe there's a skeleton in his closet um, oh, that hasn't bagel already. Bagel scandal. But a bagel scandal. <laughs> Did you see? He, do you see how many how much locks he puts on his bagels? That's He's gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> he may. I said I want a lot of cream cheese. I will not be taking questions. <laughs> you have to tell that story now. Okay, I have to tell the story. Yeah. No, we're going like down three layers of deep right. inception. Yeah. So it's when I came to Michigan a million works. years ago, <clears throat> I moved the, here from the East Coast. Before the Anthropocene. <laughs> and I, being from the East Coast, you know, we had bagels there with lox and cream cheese. And for the uninitiated, really? lox is smoked salmon. <laughs> That's delicious. And it seems so mundane. It seems mundane now. But in the early 90s... It, it seemed like it ought to be a no-brainer to get locks and a bagel with locks. Right? Yeah. It just seemed so 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 right. basic, right? Right, right? But I'd been here for like six months, nine months, almost a year. Um, and I hadn't had one. And I was really kind of jonesing for one. Yeah, no, no, I couldn't I, find a decent I jones anywhere. for one every once in a while, and I'm not even <laughs> from there. Right? And, uh, and, you know, and really it's a sort of classic with the tomato, the red onion, you know. Oh, stop. Uh, <laughs> so I was driving through this area and like was it north of here Northville I think is the name Northville yeah and there's this place Einstein's. called the no it was not Einstein's it was the New York Bagel Factory like yeah baby alright bring it <laughs> I wheel through the drive through put down my money to give me a bagel with lox and cream cheese and I wait and I wait and I wait and they give me the bagel, and I drive off, and I'm unwrapping my prize. And there's like three inches, like a three-inch slab of cream cheese in this bagel. And no lock. And no lock. It's, no, it's nothing else. Just They heard you say lots, lots of, of cream, cream cheese. cheese. They had no idea what the hell I was talking I'm about. I'm beginning to think they weren't even from Manhattan. I t- Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's a standing joke in the Potts household. <laughs> 
<laughs> lots of cream cheese. Lots of cream cheese on that bagel. Yeah. Mm. No, you smear the cream cheese. <laughs> a schmear, can you define schmear? I mean, schmear is like uh, it's a <coughs> it's a table knife full of cream cheese, and a, you spread it smoothly. It's, it's a modest amount. It's a modest. You're not amount. actually gagging down mouthfuls no, no. of cream cheese. It's like you might butter a bagel. You would yeah. smear it with cream yeah, cheese. It's not so, that much. Not that much. Maybe a little more than you'd use for butter, but not that much. More. Yeah. I don't know. Everyone probably define it. You've got your schmear. I've got my schmear. You got your, yeah, yeah. But no, it, it's <clears throat> it's arguable for me whether or not Sanders would have won the election. But I think he was the only candidate running that could have beaten Trump. That had that chance. That had the chance. Yeah. But it was the Clinton campaign that brought Trump to the table as a candidate. Right. And then the, the, there's the whole Pied Piper strategy thing where they... Which was their idea. was part of their whole plan. So. And then... Um, failed to beat him in the general right so really i think if you if you're foaming at the mouth about russia and you're foaming <coughs> at the mouth about you know 45 being in office what a nightmare yeah yeah um it was your party that brought this yeah and don't talk to me about anything and we're not exactly gonna say i'm a fan of trump and his policies oh but uh, but every any, like, day I actually wake up and do breathe a brief sigh of relief before I get on Twitter and see what what, what Trump's been producing along with his morning bowel movements. You know, you know, uh, I breathe a this brief sigh of relief that Hillary Rodham Clinton is not president. I do. Yeah, no, that was actually a real relief for me. Yeah, yeah, but not that I look forward to anything. Forty five is gonna. Oh no, no. gonna do. I mean. And like even who would? I don't think even the supporters do. No, they're they're a little fed up. Yeah, I, and just don't care. They're just glad that their guy won. Yeah, you, you know, they're they're uh, I don't know. anyway. So this was my my point. Big my this was a topic sentence. Okay, here's a topic. The Democrats were claiming that Clinton won the primary quote fair and square unquote, but everything that we've learned reveals that they can't make that argument, or at least they can't convince me of that argument anymore. No. Neither fair nor square. My Clinton supporter friends have been telling me I just need to grow up. I need to realize that this is how it's always been done, and yeah. it's what I should expect. But to me, this is Chicago machine politics. Yeah, it's gross. <clears throat> if we want to retain any ability to criticize corruption, remember that <clears throat> bit about hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. In others, you really can't only call it out when it happens to the other party. No, we have to call it out, period. Yes. So the DNC is long past due for an intervention. That's going to happen. Yeah. Last page. Last page. Even Tim Kaine is calling for an end to the superdelegate system now. Because that was a clusterfuck. That, yeah. Um, superdelegates were part of it and... Recently, though, the DNC just appointed a bunch of new ones, lobbyists and hedge fund managers. Uh, it's just straight up patronage. Yeah. Uh, the whole donation arrangement was oriented this way, not because it was the only way, but because it supports the consultant class and the patronage system they've set up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the breakdown of money is complicated because if you try and look up how much did each candidate raise, it's very complicated. Yes. Um, because it includes PACs, super PACs, party funds, outside donors. Uh, I can't begin to figure it out. But Pocket, yeah. Sanders actually raised over $200 million, almost all of it from small individual donations, averaging, I've heard slightly different figures, $27. Yeah. I mean, some of People gave him 25 and 30 bucks or less. Right. <clears throat> and... He had, he had like when he uh, was on the debate and asked for donations and mentioned BernieSanders.com, that night he got like five million. He was getting like 48 donations a minute or something like that. It was yeah. impressive. It's very impressive. He had the ability to raise a lot of funds. Yeah. Trump didn't raise even half what Clinton did. She raised, uh, do I have this down here? She raised over a billion dollars and lost. And lost. <clears throat> I, I don't understand how the... I, okay, all right, all right. So the Dem faithful, for some reason I cannot comprehend, Yeah. like her, 
they it's, like her for some reason. It, it, to some extent, I really believe it is a cult of personality. But they, she's they're into your abuela, you know. Uh, okay, so that's how you feel, and that's what you like. Okay, um, I like liver. But okay, it's, but it's, I really I love liver. I love liver and onions. Yeah. At the same no, time, they, I comprehend that other people don't want to eat it. They, uh, they really, you can't say bad things about mother. You can't do it. So it's out of bounds. But how You're can they not understand if you do that? That other people don't like her. But they really, like, no one except them likes her. So uh, the Democrats who are comfortable with this whole DNC thing. Yeah. With the fundraising and the control agreements and all that. And they're like, that's just the way it is. Grow up. I think they need. we need to ask them, would you just be comfortable handing over uh, the choice of candidates to uh, a board, uh, say, the board of Goldman Sachs? Yeah. We could just let Goldman Sachs. Because that would save us all a lot of so grief. So much time. And money. Uh, it would save so the, much money. The primaries are endless. You know, endless. They're expensive. No, I don't know if you... People have blocked out what an unpleasant experience yeah, that honest. was this time, but it just dragged on forever. Oh, gosh. At one point, my, Veronica was like, so, who's the president now? We're like, uh, Barack Obama. We still have six months She's to like, go. what? No, seriously, you guys haven't had the election yet? They haven't decided yet? It's been a year. (laughs) Like a year like this. Oh, it's awful. (laughs) No, but but seriously, it's hard to It's exhausting for them, too. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing, we really, even the strong ones, we do see them start to mentally unravel on the campaign trail. Coming to pieces. They're like, like, Sanders was doing, you know, in states he did like 40, 50 rallies, you know. Uh, it's pretty robust, but he's 72, 73, yeah, you know, know. and I, I that, just, that can't be it's got to be hard. And I mean, it's just, I can imagine just getting up there at some point, not knowing where you are. You look out and you just start speaking in tongues or something. You start yeah. gibbering. I say, hail Satan. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think if you phrased the question yeah. the right way, yeah. The answer for the damn faithful would be yes. Would be yes. Just let Goldman Sachs decide what the, who the candidate is. Yeah. Well, that's that's what it is. Mm-hmm. That's what we trust the rich. We trust we trust them because and that's why they're, they're right wingers. Because that they are right wingers. That's why they're yeah. right wingers. Our interests are their interests. What's good for business is good, good for, for us. The, it's good for we, us. We we glorious few proud identity liberals. Yeah. So and so and. And they don't understand that that is what makes them a fascist. <clears throat> it's just being on the right. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say every right winger is a fascist. I'm not going to yeah, go there. Right. I have friends that would, but I'm not there. No, it's the it's the being on the right and basically agreeing that corporate control of government and government is how we're going to do corporations. This. That's how we're going to do is, this. Is okay. It's one of okay. the same thing. It's one of the same thing, and I'm it's okay the with that system. The establishment. And it's good for us yeah. as long as you know transgenders can serve in the military. Yeah, and then wh- I'm good. And I'm what right. people weren't talking about is just how very far economically all of us continue to fall and it's only been downhill it's been free fall all of clinton all the clinton years all the obama years you know and the bush years in between going back to before carter yeah it's been about 40 years of free fall it's about so the yeah the, the phrase is utopia ended in 1972 as far as oh, economic good, prosperity. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so um, Goldman Sachs, Hillary's biggest donors were Paloma Partners, Pritzker Group, Renaissance Technology, Saban Capital Group, Newsweb Corp, Soros Fund Management. Uh, among them also Microsoft, Alphabet. That's Google. Apple, J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, Time Warner, Kaiser Permanente, Wells Fargo, etc. Mm-hmm. I'm also told that I hear people saying it's time to stop relitigating the election. Yeah. My response to that is uh, what we've learned from all of this is that we never litigated the election. It, it never happened. We never litigated. <laughs> it was never fairly and properly litigated and if that happens in a trial you get a mistrial you get a mistrial and you do it again so i'm declaring a mistrial and so are millions of other americans 
and it's going to have to be litigated somehow. This this thing between yeah. the populist wings, the the people, mm-hmm. and the centrist parties party mm-hmm. that has to be litigated if we want Americans to have any trust in the system, to have any participation, to get anything from their tax money, to get everything from their government, to get anything out of this system when they put so much effort and faith and trust into it. Right. And that, if we don't have trust in our parties, we have to change them, and that is the American way. (laughs) There. There. I got to the end. Woo! (sighs) Knew it could happen. Knew it was possible. So. So there it is. There it is. Any any closing thoughts? I'm sorry it was so long. You can see why I wanted to get the whole argument out, though. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, I don't know that there's really a good way forward. I, I mean... I don't either. We, can, we have these ideas about, well, if this, then that, then maybe, possibly, I don't know, we could all keep going. Yeah, it's very uncertain. How we how we get out of this? I just I, you know, without <laughs> la guillotine, the guillotines. Well, I, to the you barricades. Know, I don't think that, that's not going to be how Americans do it. No, it's not. It's not going to be how Americans do it. No, not really. Um, I really think that we will know after it's happened that it happened. That's yeah. The revolution will not be televised. So we'll only know in retrospect. Right. And that um. I hope things continue on for our family with in sa- with general safety and whatnot. We we really hope for stability, but stability is not possible, and so we hope for positive change. Exactly, <coughs> exactly. I I hope the changes are positive, but things seriously have to change. Absolutely, at a fundamental level, they have to change. Yeah, and um, if if for no other reason than total environmental collapse, uh, for example. And total economic collapse, and a few other example. minor yeah. minor details. It's details. Like that. Soil collapse, nutritional collapse. So, this is my farewell to the Democratic Party, not, and I have not voted Democrat for quite a few elections now, right. but um, this is yeah. why. Yeah, that's why. So it, it happens. This is the way it goes. Yes. And um, it's okay. Just so you know, it's, it's actually okay. Paul will be fine about the Democratic Party. <laughs> Um, the Democratic Party will also continue without Paul, uh, and it's okay. I'm thinking of joining the the DSA. That's one possibility. Yeah, you can uh, do that. I haven't really committed to them yet, mm-hmm. um, but it would be nice to have a little rose in my Twitter handle. Oh, that would be pretty. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Some red too. But I don't know if they're if they're the people I really uh, identify with. It's a good question. I'm just not good at parties. You know, I'm not good at. Uh, it's like. The Groucho Marx joke. I'd hate to belong to, to a club that would have me as a member. That's true. Yeah, there's that. So. so yeah, it's hard to know where your political home is. I, I'm I, apparently I've been a distributist your whole life. My and whole didn't life. Know. I just didn't know. Yeah, I haven't really found the ideology that says I read this and oh, that's me. I don't really. I don't believe I've really changed. That's the thing. Yeah. Like now, you just people never knew me. You know. Yeah, it's true. It's true. All right, and I and I just was uh, for many years. I was just like, all right, well, I'm I'm willing to compromise because I'm doing what everyone does, you right. know, like voting for Bill Clinton. You know? Everyone's doing that. I guess that's me too. And I yeah. guess I kind of. I didn't. I never voted for a Clinton. <laughs> I have <laughs> never voted for a Clinton. <laughs> oh. I wonder if you had been five or six years older, if you might have. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. But. I I voted for Jerry Brown once this one time. Yeah, yeah I'm still ashamed about how, that. How does that make you feel? <laughs> I, I'm I'm really ashamed actually. Yeah, like every time he opens his mouth, I'm just like I want to vomit. Mm. Like how did I vote for that? Jesus. Well, but hey, you know you do what you can. I voted for Obama once, so. Oh. Well, you know. All right, I gotta. We're gonna wind this up. This was uh, you're not so a racist. We're gonna. <laughs> 
Sorry. That you know of. <laughs> We're going to put this in a can, and I think I'm going to save it to release on Thanksgiving weekend. Just because on Thanksgiving weekend, everyone needs more political argument in their exactly. lives. Exactly. You're, you're sick of all this happy talk with your families. Get none of that. All the like no politics. Your turkey. So you're gravy. you're going to want this to get your blood pressure up, so you can you know stay awake long enough to lips. drive to work on monday yeah. anyway smash your keurigs <laughs> have a happy thanksgiving I, you heard that that volvo also pulled their advertiser smash from, your volvos <laughs> and, it's you know, time. drive over their keurigs with their volvos anyway bye everyone <laughs>